Imagine trying to weigh someone's IQ with bullets. In mid-19th century Philadelphia, Dr. Morton's office was filled with skulls from all over the world. He was filling cranial cavities with lead bullets, attempting to weigh human intelligence. The limited data happened to fit his own prejudice. White skulls were the largest. He asserted that intelligence was linked to brain size and that white people were born smarter. In an era obsessed with mechanics and classification, finding a tangible standard for the intangible mind became a collective desire. Darwin's cousin Galton measured people's reaction speed and head circumference in his London laboratory, while phrenologists roamed the streets, offering guidance by touching the protrusions of the skull. They all firmly believe that intelligence, like height and weight, is a measurable innate talent. However, this high-stakes gamble with skulls as stakes was a miscalculation from the start. It catered to the prejudices of the time, but led to a scientific dead end. The real turning point came in the early 20th century, when a psychologist named Binet rebet in a completely different way. In 1904, the Paris Compulsory Education Law was implemented, and a large number of children flooded into schools. However, a problem confronted the government. How to distinguish which children needed special education? Binet took on this task. He abandoned skull measurements and designed clever mental tasks, repeating numbers, recognizing shapes, and explaining word meanings. He wanted measure, not the brain size, but the problem-solving abilities and psychological age. In 1905, the Binet-Simon scale was introduced. Its initial purpose was as a diagnostic tool to identify souls in need of help so that they could receive extra care. Binet was keenly aware of the limitations of this scale, repeatedly warning that intellectual qualities are complex and cannot be simply quantified. He feared this yardstick would fall into the hands of cruel pessimists, becoming a weapon that divides people into different classes and deny their right to development. Unfortunately, his nightmare became a reality across the ocean. When Binet's scale reached the United States, everything changed. Louis Terman of Stanford University, a firm believer in eugenics, drastically modified the scale. He adopted the term IQ and transformed intelligence into a sacred number using a simple formula, psychological age, chronological age times 100. Terman insisted IQ was inborn and almost unchangeable. This number quickly became a weapon in the eugenics movement, labeling immigrants as naturally inferior and shaping intellectual discrimination that continues to this day. Terman even launched a genetic study of genius, tracking the growth of 1,528 gifted children. Decades later, most of these geniuses lived comfortable, middle-class lives without any particularly outstanding achievements. But two teenagers, Shockley and Alvarez, who were rejected due to so-called low IQ, later both stood on the Nobel Prize podium in physics. Despite all the controversy, there seems to be a powerful theoretical basis behind IQ, the G factor. In 1904, British psychologist Spearman discovered that a child who excelled in mathematics often did well in other subjects as well. He inferred that there is a common driving force behind all intellectual activities, G. IQ tests are essentially a measurement of this G. Later, neuroscientists peeked inside the brain and seemed to have found that G. They discovered that a smart brain doesn't stem from an extra genius area, but rather from a highly efficient collaborative network formed between the frontal and parietal lobes. More interestingly, when handling tasks of moderate difficulty, the brains of intelligent individuals actually consume less energy, like a sophisticated, energy-efficient engine. But the assault on IQ's throne had already begun. Scientists started asking whether G represents the entirety of intelligence. Harvard University's Howard Gardner through research on brain-injured patients and various geniuses, discovered that a person could lose logical reasoning yet keep musical genius intact. In 1983, he proposed the theory of multiple intelligences, claiming that humans have at least eight independent intelligences. A loser in an exam might be a genius on stage. A quiet thinker might have athletic talent. In Gardner's world, no one is stupid, only people with different combinations of intelligences. Despite academic criticism that his definition of intelligence was excessively too far, this theory successfully liberated countless children who were dismissed by a single score from the label of being stupid. Around the same time, Yale Sternberg launched an attack from within the fortress. His own IQ test scores as a teenager were mediocre, yet he eventually became a top psychologist. He realized the huge gap between test-taking intelligence in school and practical intelligence in real life. 
he proposed a triadic theory of intelligence. Analytical intelligence, good at tests. Creative intelligence, good at ideas. And practical intelligence, good at life. He found that many people who achieved great success in society weren't test takers, they were problem solvers. The most devastating blow came from Stanovich. He asked, why do high IQ people still make foolish mistakes, even falling into conspiracy or investment scams? He pointed out that IQ tests completely missed the point. The ability to control one's mind, resist bias, and make wise decisions. A fast brain can still be a foolish one. Those high IQ people, when they make a foolish mistake, can be even more fatal. By this point, the crown of IQ was cracked, but the final challenger came from two outsiders. New Zealand scholar Flynn discovered that, for nearly a century, the average IQ score in countries around the world has been steadily rising, increasing by about three points every 10 years. This means, by today's standards, our ancestors might all be diagnosed with intellectual disability. Intelligence may not be a fixed hardware, but a set of mental software reflecting the specific historical circumstances. If the Flint effect proved that our software can be upgraded by the environment, then the emergence of artificial intelligence directly declares that our core computing software has been surpassed. In 2016, when Google's AlphaGo made a divine move that no human player had ever seen before, defeating Go master Lee Settle, the whole world fell silent. It forces us to admit that in terms of pinnacle of the G factor, including logic, calculation, and strategy, we are no longer the fastest runners. Thus, the mirror we use to define intelligence has shattered completely. For centuries, we longed to see our place in the shape of a skull, in a sacred number, but the advent of AI ended our obsession with single-minded computing power and freed us from the infighting over who is smarter. It answered for us the question of human uniqueness, which lies precisely in aspects that IQ tests cannot measure. The intelligence of the future may no longer be an isolated cognitive ability, but a hybrid intelligence just as the Flynn effect reveals. Our brains can always adapt to the environment and upgrade their software. And now, with AI, we are witnessing the biggest upgrade in history. AI, with its unique intelligence, will become an exoskeleton for us to extend our minds and explore the unknown. Our task no longer about finding one perfect metric to define us, but to live out the wisdom of our time through curiosity, creativity, and conscience.